So this is the 10th film in the Rethinking Existentialism series uh, and throughout this series we've been uh, exploring um, the idea that existence precedes essence and what that means in the works of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir primarily but we've also looked at uh, uh, Black Skin White Masks by Frantz Fanon and, and one of the uh, one of the purposes of uh, existentialism is to offer uh, an ethical theory um, that recommends the virtue of authenticity and we saw in the last film that um, one kind of argument for that rests on the idea that inauthenticity causes us problems but we also saw that um, that kind of argument can only motivate authenticity only give you uh, a reason why somebody should uh, embrace authenticity in cases where that person would overcome uh, uh, psychic distress uh, by doing so uh, would overcome uh, anxiety uh, uh, despair uh, other kind of problems psychological problems uh, by doing so uh, and, um, and and it, and it only gives them a reason to 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 embrace authenticity and they may have uh, plenty of other reasons not to uh, that are grounded in their existing inauthentic projects so uh, that what I call the eudaimonist approach uh, characteristic of, of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's being a nothingness and of um, Frantz Fanon's black skin white masks uh, uh, can't ground uh, a moral argument that we all ought to embrace authenticity Sartre wants it to ground that argument. Fanon isn't trying to address that moral question, um, but uh, if we are trying to address that moral question uh, of whether there's a, a reason why we ought to embrace authenticity, in fact, if we if we're concerned that the idea of existentialism seems to entail a kind of nihilism, a kind of uh, absurdism, as it's sometimes called, that no matter what our values are and how much committed to them we are. Um, actually none of them really matter at all. Um, if we're concerned that existentialism leads to that view, then we need to look elsewhere uh, for an existentialist argument um, uh, against it, um, an existentialist argument for the virtue of authenticity uh, that gives us some reason to think that actually, no, there is a, 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 an overriding reason that applies to everybody um, for uh, uh, embracing the project of authenticity. And I think that an argument to that effect uh, can be found in Simone de Beauvoir's book, uh, Pyrrhus and Sinius, published in 1944. Um, it, it takes some work to find the argument in there because uh, Beauvoir develops this argument through um, uh, considering uh, uh, lots of aspects of it and lots of other attempts uh, to show that life is uh, uh, has some kind of objective meaning or some kind of objective purpose or or that there is some other reason why um, the, there are objective values or that there are ways that we all ought to live and it's through considering those in, in a very kind of um, discursive and uh, uh, relaxed essayistic style uh, that she develops what is really I think a very precise uh, uh, and sophisticated Kantian argument for uh, the virtue of authenticity. By, when I say it's a Kantian argument, I think it has a lot in common um, with, uh, with some features of Kant's moral philosophy, though it's not really very strongly similar to Kant himself. It's most similar to uh, kinds of arguments that moral philosophers have recently developed on the basis of their readings of Kant. I'm thinking particularly of Christine Korsgaard, uh, but also um, Alan Wood, uh, Alan Gewirth um, uh, and others. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk is try to articulate that argument very precisely as a sequence of uh, numbered propositions. Um, and then I'm going to say a little bit, just a little bit, about what that is committed to and what it isn't, and then I'm going to stop. Um, I think it's a hugely sophisticated argument. I think there's a lot that could be said about it. Uh, I'm not claiming that it's absolutely correct in every last detail, but I, I am claiming that I think that it should be um, uh, uh, paid some significant attention in contemporary moral philosophy because I think it does a very interesting job of trying to 
uh, uh, resolve this particular problem within uh, existentialism and to establish a, a, an existentialist uh, morality, but also that um, in, in the wider debates of contemporary moral philosophy, I think it, it, it succeeds uh, perhaps in overcoming some of the shortcomings of, uh, of similar arguments that have been advanced by Kantian moral philosophers. Okay, so um, here's the argument. The idea is that it starts from a premise that you have to accept. In this regard, it's a bit like Descartes' argument for uh, the possibility of knowledge, right? Um, it, it, in, that he wants to start from the argument, I, from the premise, I think, uh, I think, therefore I am. Um, he wants to start from that premise because he thinks that you can't doubt it. You have to accept that premise. Um, and uh, or I have to accept that premise. Um, and Beauvoir, um, Beauvoir starts from a similar position. She wants to start from a premise that I have to accept. Right. So the premise there, premise number one, uh, some ends are valuable. Some ends, some goals uh, are valuable. And she thinks that I have to accept that because she thinks that existence precedes essence. She thinks that that's what it is to be a human being. It's to value your ends. You have ends and you do value them um, because that's just what it is to be a human being. She doesn't think you particularly have to accept that theory of human existence in order to accept premise one. She just thinks that because that theory of human existence is true, right, which she thinks it is, because she thinks that's true, then she's confident that you do have ends that you find valuable, that you value. Uh, you are committed to the value of something. And as a result of that, you do have to accept premise one, some ends are valuable. Right. Then comes premise two. And I think this is, in many ways, uh, a, a very interesting premise and one that could withstand quite a lot of in philosophical scrutiny. It requires, I think, quite a lot of analysis to consider whether or not it's really uh, uh, correct. But um, I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, so here it is, premise two. It's incoherent to treat an end as valuable, but also to treat it as valuable only because I treat it as valuable, right? So if you find something valuable, something worthwhile, something important, you can't also think that it's only important because you think it is. That would undermine the idea that it is important. That would undermine the idea that it matters. In a way, this is the problem of absurdity, right? To think that something, um, uh, is, is itself valuable um, seems to be in conflict with the idea that it's only valuable because I value it. That's premise two. Premise three, to treat an end as valuable, a goal that you're trying to achieve, is to treat the achievement of it as valuable. So if you're trying to write a book, as I am, then you value the writing of that book. You value the book that you're trying to write. You value completing that project and the book being achieved. Right? If you don't value that, then you don't value writing the book. You might value the process of writing or something like that. You might enjoy the process of writing, um, but you're, then you're not treating the, the, the book that you're writing as itself valuable. To treat the book that you're writing as valuable is to treat the achievement of having written it as valuable. But once you've achieved it, it's no longer your goal. So once you've achieved it, if it's still valuable, then its value can't derive from the fact that you're pursuing it, that it's your end, that it's your goal. It must just have its value from something else. Where? Right? Where, do, where does it get that value? This is where Simone de Beauvoir introduces her idea of a point of departure, as it's called. Um, that is a potential means. Once you've achieved an end, once you've achieved something that you're trying to achieve, uh, that end that you've achieved is now a part of the world and can be used as a means to other ends. So if you've written a book, um, people can read the book. 
and take it in whatever direction they do. Right? Or if you're raising a child, then that child, uh, when you've raised them and they're an adult and out living in the world, they, they've got their own projects, they've got their own ends, and your achievement of having raised them is a point of departure for their own goals and their own ends. So this idea of a point of departure or a potential means is the key to how uh, Beauvoir thinks a, uh, an end that you're pursuing can be valuable even once you've achieved it and are no longer pursuing it. Right? Um, how does it get that value? Well, premise five, the existence of a potential means is necessary for a subjective end that requires that means. Okay. So if people are trying to um, prepare for exams uh, in existentialism as part of their philosophy degree, for example, and they pick up the book that you've written on existentialism and it helps them to achieve that goal, given that they value that goal and they value achieving that goal, your book is then has a value to them as a means to achieving that goal. Not only that, but your book has that value even if they're not trying to achieve that goal, even if nobody's trying to achieve that goal, because it's a possible end. It's something that people could try to achieve and as a result, the potential means to that end, it has a value as a potential means, uh, whether or not it's actually employed as a means to that end. Okay, that's Beauvoir's idea here. And that's what makes premise six an achieved end valuable. It's the fact that it could be used for some end that somebody else values, or, or that you value, but it doesn't matter who. So an achieved end, an achieved goal, is valuable because it's a potential means. But that value, as a potential means, depends on there being the capacity to set goals for which it is a means. This is premise seven. The value of an achieved end depends on the capacity to, to pursue projects. Uh, so premise eight, the capacity to pursue projects, the capacity to set ends, is valuable. And that's human agency. That is um, the structure of human existence, according to um, Simone de Beauvoir and according to Jean-Paul Sartre. This value, number nine, this value that it has, notice, does not depend on you pursuing it as an end. So the value of the ability to pursue projects is a value that it has, that that ability in the abstract is valuable and it's not valuable because you're, because it's your goal. It's just valuable because um, that's what explains how a potential means can be valuable. And that's what explains how a goal can be valuable once you've already achieved it. And that's something you're committed to believing by valuing your goals in the first place. So as a result, the conclusion, number 10, um, the structure of human existence is objectively valuable. It's something which you are constrained to recognise as valuable by the very fact that you have goals at all. Now, I said I would say a little bit about that, um, which is this. It's an argument. Right? It's an argument which is a, intended to establish a conclusion through a sequence of logical steps, starting from a premise which, according to Beauvoir, you have to accept. You accept that some ends are valuable. As a result of that, you have to accept that the treatment of those ends is, the achievement of those ends is valuable. And as a result of that, you have to accept that the value that that achieved end has is as a point of departure for other projects. And that requires you to accept that um, the ability to pursue projects is itself valuable and has a value independently of whether or not you recognize that value and therefore you have to accept that the capacity to set ends, the, the pursuit of projects, the structure of human existence itself is valuable. You're required by the, a sequence of logical steps from something that you already accept to also accept the objective value, to recognize the objective value of the true structure of human existence as existence precedes essence. That is, you are required uh, to embrace 
uh, authenticity. You're under an obligation to be authentic rather than inauthentic, to embrace the project of authenticity rather than the project of bad faith, which is the denial of the human condition. That's how the argument is supposed to go. The argument is not supposed to trace the actual metaphysics of value. It's not the claim that your goals are only valuable because they become to potential means to other people's goals. That's a metaphysical claim about what makes your goals valuable. That's not what's going on in the argument. The steps between each of those numbered premises are not intended to describe dependency relations in the metaphysics of value. They're just logical entailments. It's just that you, have been, according to Beauvoir, have to, have to accept each step along the way. And as a result, you're under an obligation to accept the conclusion. So this is perfectly consistent, therefore, with the idea that what makes your goals valuable is that you pursue them. In fact, uh, it adds a constraint to that, which is that you, it is only permissible to pursue goals which respect the value of human agency, which respect the value of uh, the capacity to set goals. So any uh, uh, projects of yours that involve subjugating people to your aims that do not respect their capacity to set their own, pursue their own projects um, are unacceptable because you're under an obligation to respect their capacity to do so. But within that constraint, any projects that you pursue uh, are, are morally acceptable, but they're more than that. They're valuable, I think, for Beauvoir things, and they're valuable because your capacity to set ends, your capacity to pursue projects is itself valuable. And so the exercise of it is valuable. And so your pursuit of projects is valuable. So it turns out that uh, within the constraint of authenticity, your projects are meaningful. The things that you value are really valuable. Um, but outside of that constraint, then your projects are not only uh, morally um, uh, are wrong because they violate this obligation that you're under to respect other people's um, uh, uh, agency, but um, they are also genuinely valuable. So they're not uh, they're genuinely not valuable. They are absurd. Um, that is the message, I think, of Simone de Beauvoir's book, Pyrrhus and Sinius. Um, it's a shame that Having been published in French in 1944, it was 60 years before it was available in English in uh, 2004. But now that it is available in English, I think we should be taking it very seriously as a contribution to moral philosophy uh, and considering the details of that argument for authenticity. <laughs>